Welcome to WE21, the world's largest conference for women engineers. One of the great things about engineers is they take challenges and turn them into opportunities. And I urge you to do exactly that this year. While we wish we were presenting to everyone live, the challenge of connecting virtually is also an opportunity to connect and network with more people than ever. I invite and challenge you to find the opportunities to chat with your peers during our presentation if you're watching virtually. I have made many amazing connections at SWE in the past, and I'm sure you will too. Okay, let's talk about breaking the bamboo ceiling of senior leadership. Asian Americans make up a significant portion of the engineering workforce. However, there is a lack of representation at the senior and executive leadership levels. In the United States in 2018, approximately 40% of the women are in management positions. However, only 2.4% are women of Asian descent. Catalyst shared in 2020, women of color represented 18% of the entry level positions, though few advance to leadership positions from managers to C-suite. Women still make up approximately 40% of management positions. White women held about one third of these positions, while Asian women are at 2.2%. In this session, we will talk with our panelists who have passed through the double pane ceiling of glass and bamboo. We will explore topics and issues relevant to diversity and inclusion in the workplace with respect to the various Asian cultures and experiences, as well as generate more awareness of the biases toward Asians. We'll develop strategies for planning the next step of your career and learn techniques for becoming a more inclusive leader or team member and how to advocate for yourself and others in a diverse workplace. My name is Jennifer Chen Morikawa and I will be your moderator for today's session. I am a director for the Society of Women Engineers Board and I am a senior manufacturing engineer and a business planner for General Motors manufacturing engineering team. To start off, I would like to invite each of our panelists to introduce themselves and share with us their educational and work background and how they got their current position. Diane, would you do us the honor of starting? Sure. Thank you, Jennifer. So my name is Diane Aldridge. Um, I, uh, I grew up in China. I'm a Chinese Canadian American right now. Um, I got uh, my education background. I have three degrees from three different countries. I have my engineering degree from China, and I have a, a commerce degree, bachelor degree from Canada, and I have my MBA from UT Texas. So that's my engineering background. I have worked uh, in manufacturing for 20 years, 21 years actually to be exact. Uh, so to summarize this, uh, uh, my career, um, it's four numbers, 21, nine, seven and three. So I did 21 years in manufacturing, global manufacturing. Uh, nine, I did nine different type of jobs within the manufacturing. Seven has seven different type of bosses, different bosses from different countries, different gender, different religion, seven different bosses. Three, I lived in three different countries um, as I was, because uh, I work in global manufacturing. So I started off as a um, uh, manufacturing engineer, application engineer on the factory floor. And then um, uh, over the 20 years, I move up to middle management to executive. Uh, my last position in this field, I was a managing director of a global manufacturing. Uh, I had a PL of three factories. Um, I had a factory in Houston, one in China, one in um, um, Milan, Italy. So that was my uh, that was my professional uh, background mainly. And in the past eight months, I have moved from uh, manufacturing to high tech. So right now, uh, my position is I'm a global business development executive in uh, industrial AI ML for AWS, Amazon AWS. Thanks, Diane. Uh, hey guys, nice to meet you all. I'm Vandana Khanna. I'm the director of digital finance transformation at Unilever. I head up the automation practices as Diane mentioned, I also lead AI, ML, RPA practices at Unilever. I joined Unilever more than two years ago. I came to US as a young adult immigrant, to be precise, from India after completing my undergrad in engineering from IIT and came here with a dream to study further. I was born in Agra, the city of Taj Mahal, for those who are curious where exactly I'm from. I'm an MBA in finance and technology. I made this country as my home, started my career and raised a family. 
I have worked for large organizations like Johnson & Johnson, Pepsi, Toys R Us, Verizon, and now at Unilever. Very happy to be here. I've been part of SWE for several years now. Looking forward to seeing everyone in person at some point in future conferences. Thank you, we're happy to have you. Sarah. Thank you, Jenny. My name is Sarah Koenig and I work for Raytheon Technologies, which was formerly United Technologies Corporation. I'm an associate director overseeing the team responsible for manufacturing cost modeling and part valuation. I joined the company as a member of the Manufacturing Engineering Development Program at Pratt & Whitney immediately after graduating from the University of Rhode Island's International Engineering Program, where I earned my BS in Industrial Engineering and my BA in French, while also spending six months abroad completing an internship in France. Throughout my career, I've worked in a variety of positions and disciplines, including operations, quality, supply chain, manufacturing, and program management. After I completed the Manufacturing Engineering Development Program, I worked in supplier quality, working with our Italian supply base. I next joined the Operations Leadership Program, coinciding with the completion of my MBA from Carnegie Mellon University. In the Operations Leadership Program, I completed three different rotations across the company, um, different company divisions. On completing the rotational program, I joined Collins Aerospace as a Transitions Manager, where I managed part transitions of machined and cast parts into Singapore, Malaysia, and Taiwan. I next returned to Pratt & Whitney, taking a role in industrial management for the NGPF engine. Within industrial management, I held several different roles of increasing responsibility. The success of my immediate last role, which was leading the implementation of a major design change to one of our high-profile commercial engine programs, led my current manager to reach out to me and ask me to lead um, the group. Outside of work, I've been a member of SWE Hartford since I graduated from the university and I'm a life member of SWE. I was born in South Korea and I was adopted by a white American family as an infant. So I think that's given me kind of a unique perspective on being an Asian American and my experiences. Thank you, Sarah. All right, and let's uh, meet Kalyani, our last panelist. Hi, I'm Kalyani Malela, currently a Senior Director of Research and Development in Johnson & Johnson. I lead the instrument and accessories development for our general surgery robotic platform, Otawa. I'm currently based in Cincinnati. I'm originally from India. I have a bachelor's in electronics and communication, and I migrated to the US for my graduate studies and I have since been here. I have a master's in electrical engineering from University of Minnesota, and also a master's in management of technology. I've always worked in the med device industry, have worked in startups, public and private companies, primarily always been within research and development, but I've also worked in quality and regulatory. I'm excited to be here today. Thank you, Kalyani. All right, before we get deep into our session, another background question for each of you. Did you always have the desire to go up the corporate ladder and what motivated you? Diane, could you please start again? Yeah, I think growing up in Asia, this is a uh, this is across uh, all Asian countries. And when you're when you were, you know, you we were raised to be you want to be successful. That's the expectation. So um, yeah, it was built in in me that I'm supposed to uh, make it on my own, be independent, and then successful in a career. And in a narrow uh, sort of a, a definition of a, especially in the Asian family, and the success, and it was drilled in me, is to be success in your career. And then um, before pandemic, a lot of, you know, across all cultures, I think career success, a lot of 80% um, of the time means a career ladder. So yes, I had this in my mind uh, since I was uh, um, since I was in school. Thank you, Diane. Wandela, did you have the same sort of thing? Yeah, thanks for the question. Absolutely. Growing up uh, as a kid in back in India, I always wanted to be a leader. Without even knowing what the meaning of leader is or was, I was the head girl of my school. I was the team captain of sports. I was front runner for all the activities which are happening in school. So I think it was just the school inspiration and seeing myself doing better and better. And there was also a competitive spirit. I always wanted to race against the boys. No hard feelings, but yes, I wanted to do better than them. And um, whenever they were uh, solving math problems, I was the first one to raise my hand. And that's how I think it was instilled in me. There was nothing else but math, which I was always 
running towards. So I became an engineer. But this was always there. When I came here, then I also wanted to do that. It took me just a few years to break that bamboo ceiling, but I did that. Uh, but yes, to answer your question, I always wanted to be a leader. Thank you. It's great to know. What about you, Sarah? My parents love telling stories about how when I was little, I would organize everybody and try to get them to do something that I wanted to do, whether it was a play or a help people out. So that was something that was with me from a very young age. I was really lucky that my dad especially encouraged me from you know, as, long, as far back as I can remember to do any that I could do anything that I wanted to do and that only I would be the limit to uh, where I went. So that was in me from a very young age. Um, as I went through college, I met, I joined SWE. I met some amazing leaders through at the conferences and in leadership roles as I got involved more in the society. I want, and they inspired me to become more like them and to attain and reach where they wanted to be. So it's something that I've had an aspiration for for a very long time. Great, thank you. And Kalyani, what about you? I see a thread with every panelist that here you are today, right? So I echo some of Diane's feelings is as an Asian, you know, your success was measured by how much you grew or where you stood. If it was in a class, did you score the most rank? Or, you know, if you were part of a team similar to Vandana, did you lead the team? Were you the team captain, right? So there were some of that, I would say, obviously instilled in me. I echo some of Vandana's comments of being a leader. And I will say probably I never really realized that being a leader necessarily meant having the title, right? So I would say my aspiration has always been to be a leader. And, you know, my parents share stories too similar to Sarah's about, oh, you did this as a kid and that's a leadership quality. And I was like, oh, did I? Did I exhibit that as a kid that I never even knew, right? So for me, I would say is I think I always wanted to be a leader. But what I realized with time, and probably this is part of my cultural upbringing, is it's all about the community and what you do and what you give back. And I realized in corporate America, sometimes to be able to have that influence as a brown woman, to have a difference for other diverse candidates, it's more the leadership and the title that can have some of the influence, right? So for me, I think my aspiration of, yes, I want to be a leader, but I want it associated with a title in order to be able to have some of these hard conversations and made an impact came much later in life as I realized more of it. But um, I'm probably with one that I said, oh, I always wanted to be a leader. I just didn't know what that translated to until much later. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you all for sharing. So now we're gonna turn into some of our uh, more submitted or organized questions and wanna hear more about all of your experiences and perspectives when it comes to diversity and inclusion in the workforce. Um, and then, you know, all of you uh, watching this, you may know our Asian cultures and our experiences influence and shape us. So let's talk about a little bit bias awareness. So my first question is um, back to Diane, um, is that uh, most Asian Americans experienced cultural discrimination and perhaps benefits at work. So if you could please share some of your experiences with us. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. I think, yeah, so that's definitely true. Uh, we have our own biases, right? And it's built in and you, you uh, I think, it, um, I, I think I'm highly aware of it, especially most of us are engineers, especially for women engineers in, in the in the West, right? We're working, so I work in global manufacturing, uh, engineering, and also oil and gas. So that was my past. Um, so it's heavily male dominated industry. Um, with uh, the, the biases typically they will say Asian is maybe a good at math and, and smarter work hard. Like we have this personal personal brand of a branding uh, attached to all of us that we work hard and we are quiet and we don't blow our own horns and then you know we're dependable. So that's the uh, that's the brand and then most of us actually somehow, fit in that brand. So it, it works in our favor when um, you get hard assignments sometimes, but a, a work against our uh, against our favor is uh, the people's biases. They don't really perceive Asian and it's Asian woman 
uh, as the leader. So when people talk about I'll give you $200 million to take care of, um, you know, when you when they when when they put you against uh, against a white male, and you wouldn't be a very obvious choice. So you really have to uh, f f fight very hard to overcome that. Well, thank you. Yeah, I've definitely seen those um, different biases play out through my career as well. So, uh, Wandala, um, have you experienced any biases because of your physical appearance or cultural background? And if so, how did you overcome or take advantage of them? Thanks for the question. Yes, absolutely. I will not deny it. Although I had no idea I was facing so many challenges and microaggressions when I landed here. But yes, I faced it. The first thing was my accent, uh, Indian accent, heavy Indian accent. And that's the first thing which people notice when you open your mouth to speak. And I realized, uh, earlier on that I'm not able to match the people around me. I think I developed, uh, I would say, a lack of confidence within me just because I thought I could not converse properly. I could sense that there was no small talk I could make. I did not understand the games people were playing uh, or the football games or soccer games, or I did not understand the jokes people were making. This was back when I landed here 20 years ago. So it was very difficult for, uh, for me to put myself along with them and have a socializing conversation. I could not understand anything. I felt I lacked in vocabulary. So it was a lack of confidence constantly seeping me uh, inside me. And I think it was imposter syndrome, which was eating me alive at that point of time without me realizing it. And I felt I will not be able to move forward or do anything because this always thought comes to my mind, okay, how will I converse with them? And this happened many times when I can relate to two incidents which really opened my eyes that uh, a person asked me when I was almost 15 years in this country that, hey, did you just move here? And it just hit me hard that they're talking about my accent. I said, no, it's been a while. And then I said, should I change my accent? Should I change something about me? Because this imposter syndrome was eating me alive. And, uh, but there were friends, there were people around me who helped me. They said, no, you're fine. People can understand you. People can relate to you. People can simply understand how you're making a point. So you don't have to change anything. So that was one thing. And then just a couple of years ago, someone said, hey, are you allowed to vote? So it's my skin, my color, my accent, everything precedes whatever I'm doing. Whoever I am, forget that. It's just these come forward. So yes, a lot of it to this date, there are people who will judge you, who will look at you. Over time, things have changed, I would say, but earlier on, it was very difficult to have that confidence and say, okay, I can do multiple other things because there was so much going around you that you were trying to go back in your shell. If I did not have my mentors, supporters, and advisors, I call them board of advisors or allies, I would not have come out of that shell. And I would not have been able to stand on my two feet and say, nope, I am enough who I am. And uh, those were the turning moments when I started uh, breaking those stereotypes. But earlier on, it was a hard one. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I know my parents, they've been in the United States now for about 50 years and they still have their accent, right? And they don't really know um, certain things. So they definitely are still feeling it, probably even retirement when they go out. Sarah, um, since you were adopted, what what is your uh, perspective on this? So the cultural background that I was raised with is not the cultural background that everybody else expects that I was raised with. Because my dad is Polish and my mom is a Western European blend. Um, so people, but people assume that my parents are Asian. They see my last name, but it's my husband's name. So they think, oh, her last name must have been Lee Park or Kim. And uh, it was actually Polish in, this, in descent. Um, so I think people underestimated me a lot before they got to know me because they assumed that I would be quiet and non-confrontational in meetings and they didn't expect me to speak up, which uh, is not in my nature of many meetings. So I've kind of used it as an element of surprise and it's worked to my advantage. Um, I've also used it as to, as to my advantage in establishing myself kind of 
via phone or email first, because if you look at my name or you hear me speak, I have no accent. My name doesn't indicate that I'm Asian. So people would be very surprised when they met me um, that I was of Asian descent and have it, throwing them off that way kind of gave me an advantage in the discussion. Um, in terms of physical appearance, I, you know, like many of us, I work with a lot of men. I tend to be the shortest one in the room or on the shorter side. So I'm always very cognizant that I'm standing up straight. I'm projecting confidence, um, which is something probably my male colleagues don't think about as much. All right, thank you. So very similar question, our last one, um, our last official one is um, about cultural background and our upbringing. So what has influenced your professional success today from those um, different backgrounds and upbringings that you have? Kalyani, could you share your perspective? So I think when I reflect back, probably two things that have served me well, um, but there's a caveat in that, right? So one is, I mean, culturally, I think most of us is from Asian heritage, hard work, right? Like that's a key word is you work hard, you work hard and success will come. You have to do everything you can. Like, what can you do more? Like hard work, whether it was school work, what are the extracurricular things you do? Like, it was just, that's how I was raised. One thing I've realized is I think it served me well in the sense it allowed me to always go above and beyond or always exceed expectations in my roles because that's what I thought I had to do. So it was natural to me, right? The caveat I will call out is that alone is not enough. You have to be an advocate of all the hard work you do. So that was not taught. So we'll come to that question later. But I think hard work is one thing that stuck with me and probably allowed me to always exceed expectations. Um, the second thing is probably it's more upbringing, but also culturally, right? It's always been about community. How do we come together and move forward? Which has translated to me in teamwork. How do I collaborate effectively and really together we deliver on a solution, right? It's not just me, but how do I bring everybody across? So as I grew in my roles, obviously I never work on any single thing myself. I have a team. I have to bring cost functional partners and stakeholders and get their alignment. So. I believe those two aspects that were just kind of ingrained in me is together we succeed and work hard probably allowed me to grow and continue to serve well for me today. Thank you. Wanda, do you have anything else to add to that? No, oh, I'll probably echo what Kalyani said because we both were raised in India and we came here as immigrants. So absolutely uh, centered around respect for authority working hard that's what i learned from my parents and always remembering that knowledge is power so for me studies education again like everyone said every asian would think about that that yes that was the main thing and i loved math so much that i wanted to go to iit which i mentioned earlier so this is one of the prestigious institution in india if you think about it, it's comparable to MIT, but the acceptance rate is less than 2%. And when I told my parents I wanted to go in that, first of all, they were scared. They said, oh, you will leave the house or you will compete with boys. They will stay, stay over there. And that was one big shock for them. So initially they did not support, but when they realized I got in, they had no choice but to say, okay, go, we'll, we are here for you. And they gave me all the confidence to compete and do it. And it was not easy, easy to encourage engineering uh, for girls at that point of time. I'm talking 20 years ago, but uh, I made it. I was the only girl from my city to made it to that school. So I think the confidence came in and my parents were always there for me, always there. And that is one thing I learned that be there for your family, be there for your family, no matter what they want, look up to their aspirations and be part of it. And I think that's what I learned and I, my love for math, engineering, and STEM is still there, still alive. Although I'm an MBA now in finance and tech, but I still deal with finance and numbers all the time. So I would say that drive starts from your childhood. Whatever you are bringing and your parents teach you and your society and your culture teach you, I think it stays forever. And that's what I'm doing for my kids also. Whether they become engineers or not, that is their choice, but I would hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anything real quick, Sarah, from you? Yeah, so this is one of the things that's influenced my professional success is that being adopted, I was I was put up for adoption because I was born to high school students 
So out of wedlock in a very conservative Korean culture back in, back in the 80s. So I had no future really or advantage if I had stayed in Korea. And remembering that is something that's fueled my ambition and my drive to succeed. Um, and I recently was speaking with an uh, executive at Pratt & Whitney who also happens to be from Korea and we actually share the same clan. And he, he pointed out that our lineage can be traced back over 30 generations. Um, and our actions reflect upon those 30 generations. And for comparison, you know, to get an appreciation for how far back 30 generations are, Mayflower, which is where a lot of European um, people, people of European descent in the US can trace their lineage back to, that's only 16 or 18 generations. So that's, this is pretty far back that we are uh, trying to prove, uh, do, do proud. Oh, thank you. Now, Wandela talked about, you know, 20 years ago and everything. So, Diane, I'd kind of like to hear from you, kind of compare what corporate um, and academic environment today versus the earlier periods of your career was like being an Asian American woman as our final kind of extra bonus question in here. Um, I, I don't really have that good of news. I don't think it changed that much. Uh, the, the progress I'd like to see, I have a daughter in engineering right now, third year engineering. Um, I, I'm not really 100% confident that it will be that much better for, for her. So, um, so because in corporate America, and it's still, I think that it's progress is, it's a, uh, bit of slow uh, painfully and then I think that uh, this uh, group of women um, because we're all we all kind of passed that um, it's a strong group of women I, I want to just make a comment that that count the strong confidence level because I think um, from 20 years to now it's a progress for me specifically I think um, for a lot of uh, especially from uh, immigrant from Asian women because I didn't I don't think we especially when we move here we didn't come at the, this this high confidence to come over the uh, my confidence build up over the course of 20 years and then every and then backed by events and backed by accomplishment and every little bit and then you 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 realize and one step at a time and build up that confidence and then still you have doubts and then the the other thing is um this is applied to Asian women. Um, it also applied to a lot of women. Is uh, um, there's a thing to uh, uh, say that um, uh, women are higher for their accomplishment and men higher for their potential, and um, you know, and men make uh, men are forgiven and uh, women make mistakes. That's still very very true. So the fact that, like what Sarah said, every time you walk in the door, uh, regardless of your accomplishment, you actually have to start from zero. You have to prove yourself to this room full of. Um, you know, mostly a man in, in our field. And you have to reprove yourself over and over. Every time you make a mistake, uh, if you're a white man, and typically you, you get to start from seven. And even we all start from, from, from nine or 10. And if you make a mistake, you probably have to start from zero, rebuild it, because people will immediately have that doubt. That's the struggle. You have to constantly deal with it. And men typically, if they make mistake and they're they could be forgiven very quickly. So that's the struggle. We will continue. I don't think it gets any better. And thank you for being very real about that answer, because I know I have struggled when I felt like I have failed to regain that confidence in myself as well. And, um, you know, not advancing sometimes partially, you know, partially it was my um, desire because not right time, I felt for me, but also um thinking like I don't know if my leaders are looking at me anymore now because of those things right yeah. so thank you all again for sharing that and all the awareness that you've brought to these different biases so let's move on to talking about taking that next step and those strategies that we have so I'd like to start with uh Kalyani um how did you start that conversation about going into a senior leadership position and with whom? So, I mean, I think we can all define leadership and senior leadership in different ways. I would say first was talking with my mentors. And Sri was a big part of it because talking to mentors who were not within my company and outside allowed me to 
actually ask some more deeper questions of why I want to go for a role, what are really my strengths, how do I take out title aside, because we realize that title means so many different things in every different company. So, you know, make it more about the things I enjoy or the strengths I bring to the table, right? So I would say those mentors within SWE and even outside have helped me really first identify and do my own self-assessment and understand where I want to go, right? Two, it's always obviously your one level manager because they're key in talent conversations if you're thinking about moving internally in an organization. I've also closely, at least always let my HR partners know because you know, at least the companies I've worked for have actually moved a couple of different companies. I've always not, you know, some of us all have moved companies and understand, right, is it may not be within your same division. If you're in big companies, it could be a different division. So letting your HR leaders know because they probably see opportunities differently than your direct manager would do. And the other thing I've done um, is also, right, is what is required in this company for this leader. So I know Diane mentioned something earlier about how we have to prove ourselves. And I will say time and again, I feel like I'm starting at zero. If you entered into a company, all your experiences outside are forgotten and all of a sudden you have to redo everything in this company to get to the next level. So the other thing I would add is always align to the expectations within this group and this org and this leader because their expectations for what they want a senior leader to do might be different, whether it's experiences or skills. And then how do you map it to ensure that you close those gaps? Thank you. Sarah, what about you? How did you start? I, uh, I took advantage of one-on-ones and skip level meetings with uh, my boss's boss to discuss what my future ambitions were. You know, both like Kellyanne was saying what I was interested in um, or what I wasn't interested in because that was just as important and the types of leadership levels that I aspired to at different points. Um, you know, discussions with my managers and my mentors, mostly within my company um, I've mostly use, utilized my SWE mentors for uh, more broad uh, advice, career advice. Um, I came prepared with examples from my work, you know, what I had done, what I was working on, show why I would be a good fit for senior leadership roles. I didn't. I wanted to kind of move past the um, the stereotype that all I was all about built, climbing the ladder. And you know, that's all I cared about. And but I had some real, I put some real thought into it, and had reasons for wanting to do it. So it wasn't just to get a shiny title. It was because I thought that I could make a difference, and that I had the work to back it up. And as the as those conversations became more detailed with more work that I had done, uh, we were able to narrow in more on what would be good fit roles and what wouldn't be. And they pinged their networks to help me actively look for my next opportunity. Oh, great. All right, so our next question was, who helped along the way and anyone from Asian descent? Wandala, uh, Wandala did you have anyone helping you along yeah. the way? No, absolutely. And I will piggyback on what everyone said. There is, there is help and there was help. Um, mentors, definitely. So when I raised my hand that I wanted to be a leader, I reached out to my mentors. I always wanted to be a leader. So I felt I was always ready, but others were not. So it was the opposite thing going on. So my mentors actually helped me. They said, you know, perception should be the reality. If others see you as a leader, then, then the path is sort of simple, uh, easier compared to everything else, but you have to show it. You should all be working on high impact projects because as female, we'd end up doing whatever is being asked for. We don't think about if you're working on something which is high impact and something which will carry more weight for the organization. So that is where my mentor started coaching me. Take up opportunities where you can prove you are in front of the leadership to prove that you can do it. And then the titles will follow. But first you have to build your brand. And of course, we again don't think about building our brand. We just do the work. Our bosses are happy, we are happy. But the problem is then you will be considered a doer you will not be considered as a leader. As a leader, you have to show up as a leader to be one. So my mentors were amazing throughout my uh, career and I found them through hard ways. I did not find them earlier on, but when I started finding, I have tons now, I had tons before and everyone had something unique to say. 
and those things helped me and so i had mentors of every ethnicity every background male female whoever you can think of and they were playing plenty everyone telling me something which is different which i have not heard before someone talking to me about branding someone talking to me about elevator pitch someone talking to me about building something which is impactful and which people can see someone telling me not to take constantly notes because as women we also uh, are in the you know habit of taking notes and not raising our head up and listening they said if you want to be a leader act like a leader show up in a room command the room women just sit in one corner and they don't take up space they will just keep on huddling 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 if there are four people coming in men command the room they spread out sprawl forward command the room whether you take the first seat sometimes we'll be scared to but then take the second seat be there talk if you can't raise your voice at least support someone who is not able to raise their voice so i have plenty of examples but i would say these mentors helped me throughout i built sponsors along the way who were ready to put their neck out for me my bosses helped me along the way and i would say i got outside in perspective also people inside the organization as well as people outside the organization helping me so it takes a village to raise a female to come to that shattering the bamboo ceiling so to speak because as uh, diane was saying that if a female makes a mistake a woman makes a mistake everyone remembers but if a woman stands up for herself she stands up for everyone so it takes truly a ton of people so that kind of moves on to our our last question with the roadblocks that uh, are met and uh, how we're overcoming them so diane can you Share about any of those along your career. So yeah, so like I said earlier, I um, I'm hopeful, but I'm still pessimistic. The rope, there will be the roadblocks are there, and it will continue to be there. Um, I I had nine different type of job, right? Progressively, um, and there are good jobs. And sometimes I move to different countries. I take on different type of functions and everything. But you need to remember, uh, career is yours. You you manage. You own your own career. Nobody will hand anything to you. So you have to like what uh, Vandana said. You have to you have to be mindful and constantly think about it. And who you associate yourself with, what kind of branding, and the roadblocks, I think, continue to be other people's. Uh, one of the big things is other people's bias and your own block in your own head, right? For Asians, we're quiet, we work hard, and then you don't really make yourself known. You have to, you have to remove that. You have to get over that. It's not easy because it's it's uh, it's it's sort of in conflict with our culture, uh, how 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 we do it. But you have to, you have to make a brand. To incorporate, to let people give you uh, opportunity. It's basically, it's the brand, your personal branding is about what you, you know, they say that it's what people say about you when you're not in the room. Who's going to speak up for you when you're not in the room? Who's going to raise your name when there's a project there? So you do need to uh, remove, try to, try to do that. A lot of the roadblocks actually is in, within our own. And then the external one, um, one of the things I use throughout my life here is humor. Um, it's, it, it's if used well and it could it could raise it, it could it could help you out. So it's it, it could be tricky. Um, I'll just give you a very quick story. This happened two years ago at a tech conference. And then I have I was sitting with uh, 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 customers and our own and they're all VP and up. Uh, so this is a, a steak dinner steakhouse dinner. And then so the customer's leader is a, a, a leader, a vice president of a customer, major company. And he's, he just he, he just said, uh, so Diane, uh, how is your driving really? And then everybody sort of hold their breath because people sort of frozen a little bit. Well, what is he saying, right? Uh, and so I looked him up, I looked at him, I said, well, you know what, I am everything they say about women, Asian women drivers. So when I'm on the road, you should stay out of my way. So then they, <laughs> they everybody just start laughing, right? And he's not done. This is two years ago, guys. And he's a senior person. And he said, so what if I ask you, how's dry cleaning business? And this time everybody froze, absolutely froze. There's six people. Um, and then I didn't miss a beat. I looked him up. I, I, look, I just looked straight him in the eye. I said, well, I'm just going to tell you, most of them are Korean and I'm Chinese. If you try to be funny, at least get your Asian insult right. And then that's it, right? So everybody laughed. I earned street cred with my 
my own leader, right? So, and then after that, I, I never said, dude, you're so lucky you ran into her. So I said, yes, dude, you can't do that, right? That was not okay, right? So, so after that, so you need to, so not everybody's black and white, and so he's clearly did something wrong. So if you be an outrage machine and you couldn't do, you couldn't deal with it or something, and you get mad, you walk away, or you pour water in his face, like, what do you do, right? And this happens all the time quite often. So I think th those are the things, right? If you, 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 you build up the resilience, use humor, use, you know, use your, uh, use your intelligence and you deal with it and you, you use your confidence, use your strength. So I do think um, you do need to practice that, but uh, as you move up, you, as you build up your confidence and these, you need to build up that you, whatever works for you, build up that brand and also build up your strength and then to, to deal with it and leverage that and then to, to your advantage. And then you can, you, can, uh, you, you can build a good impression and then and people will look at you in a different way. And then and I think your career will go up too. Thank you. That's some really great advice, really great humor too. Thank you for sharing that story. Uh, Wandala, do you have any other um, advice since I know your career has also been a little bit longer um, to share some, some things that you have done to overcome some of the roadblocks. Um, yeah, I've been working for the last 18 years. For the last 10 years, I have been in leadership roles, multiple roles across multiple companies. Yes, as uh, other panelists mentioned, every time you have to prove yourself and every time there is a roadblock and perception precedes you, which I mentioned earlier also. So you have to work it up again, make sure you find the right people, right board of advisors all around you. And humor is important, but sometimes it will not come naturally unless you practice and there is something witty around you. Diane was successful, I was not. I would say empathy come first to me. And I think I capitalized on that. I became one of those leaders who was always the go-to. People would come to me, approach me, and I would be always hearing and be open to them as much as possible. I became a mentor to so many. I started volunteering. I started teaching young kids. I started supporting ethnic communities. And I think that is how I build my brand. Championing diversity and inclusion, championing the voice, talking about women who are not able to have a voice in a room, being uh, the sponsor for those who are not able to speak up. And I think that gave me more power. People started realizing, yes, she can talk about it and she can absolutely support so many who never felt uh, they had a voice before. So I think that that was one thing. So roadblocks are always there, but you have to find ways. I found my way through this. I said, okay, the more people I support and I'm the one who is there whenever they you know, ask for it, this will help me move forward. And that did, that did because people realize, yes, she's the one empathetic leader whom people can reach out to anytime. She'll be all years, never judging others and never thinking about anything else. And those things matter a lot, especially now when are so remote, people are looking for people are looking up to leaders who are there supporting them day in, day out. So they, these things carry weight. And I would say, again, my mentors, my sponsors, uh, leaders always supported. They were always there. And uh, if I didn't find a good mentor, I moved to the other. I never hesitated because there is always something good in someone else. So I kept on building. And right now my board of advisors are quite a few. Thank you. That's some really great advice and also a great segue into our last section for our topic today, which is around tips for inclusion and advocating for yourself and others. So as we wrap this up, um, um, Sarah, what advice do you give an employee who's hardworking, knowledgeable, but seldom speaks up in meetings to contribute actively? Uh, it can be really scary trying to start talking in meetings. So I try to help them find an on-ramp and to increase participation. Tell them to find an ally in the room who will give them a prompt or an entry into, into the conversation. Um, to start, and then start with small contributions. So it, maybe it's just simply agreeing with somebody or saying, yes, I saw that too. Um, and then work your way into the bigger ones where you're saying to you know, multiple people, no, I don't agree with that. I don't think we should do that. And this is why. 
um, you know, we don't just like, you know, you, we crawl before we walk and we walk before we run the same thing with participating um, and speaking up in meetings. I also would tell them to look for volunteer opportunities, whether it be SWE committees, or company ERGs, something of that nature to practice speaking up in a non-threatening, low stakes environment. Um, I know for me personally, work participating in SWE leadership and participating in things like these helps me develop a lot of the soft skills that I needed for work in a very safe environment where if, you know, I said something incorrectly or I said, had a string of 20 ums when I was speaking initially, it was a low stakes and it helped me figure things out for the workplace where things were a little bit more of a, a higher stake environment. Awesome. Great, thank you. Any other advice that you would have, Wanda? Yeah, I would say one thing from my experience, um, don't lose your identity. And um, earlier on when I came here, I never claimed my identity. Like people would call me by any name and I accepted it. They compared me to someone else, I accepted it because I looked like someone. That is something I still have in my heart and I have not forgotten. So I would say the youngsters who are trying to build their career or moving forward and they don't speak up. The first thing you should claim is your name your own self and have that confidence and faith in you because you are here for a reason. And that is more than enough. Now keep on moving forward and don't lose that. So I would say, as Sarah mentioned, have allies, have the right people, volunteer, be present, be visible. For us Asians, visibility is the big thing. Most of the time we are considered an invisible community because we have forgotten and we know that. So how should we make ourselves that we are visible? And we should speak up for our own work. Sometimes we just don't want to because we say our work speaks louder than uh, anything else. But actually you should be speaking loudly than your words. Nobody else will. You have to be your own biggest cheerleader because no one else will cheer for you. So I'll stop at that. Many good things are already said, but absolutely open your mouth. It's the biggest asset. Thank you. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm a little behind on the slides there. <laughs> I'm so enthralled with all of your speaking. <laughs> so, all right. Our uh, next question, Kalyani, if you could share your perspectives on what a new employee should know or pay attention to upon entering the corporate world. I would say I would actually build on what Sarah and Vandana shared, right? Is because some of those start off as you start as a new employee in corporate world or as an employee, you move to a new team or a new company, right? First is you've earned that seat and so own it and be visible, right? And that means if you have questions in the meeting, speak up, don't be afraid, right? No question is a dumb question. So that also drives your confidence and how you project. Two, it is very important you remain true to who you are. And I know, especially when you're much earlier in your career and much younger in life too, is you don't know what that means, right? So probably you're trying to identify what that is, but as you build your brand, echoing back to what Diane and Vandana said earlier, as you start working on building your brand, then always stay core to what your brand is and build that up. And three, the important, for me, I think is a big part is your network whether that's network in your team, in your company, your sweet community, or if you move to a new location, something around that is probably outside even work is build that network because I think we all probably on this panel can attest to it. You need that community and network to shine at work or even have a work-life balance or even be sane on days, right? So make sure you build that network, whether it's your running group or the group you go out and you know enjoy restaurants, whatever that is for you, right? It's very important you build your network and don't give everything to work, right? There is more life outside of work. So be mindful of that. All right, great. And then I'm gonna move on to our last question. Uh, with what actions are needed from leaders and employees to be better advocates for better pay or just being prepared for that next level. Diane, do you have uh, anything you'd like to share here? Uh, I think uh, uh, there are a lot of things that, okay, so there are a lot of effort to build um, on behalf of minorities and women. Um, what I like to see is to put more effort to build up the, uh, the allies. 
So when people think about, you know, like we're Swiss, so we, we, even when I build a ERG system, I actually try to have a balance, have more men in the uh, women in STEM chapter. I go to, I go to leaders that there are men and to be in the chapter to show up. It's not, a, I tell everybody, it's not a sorority, okay? We need, so uh, most of my mentors are men, right? So, so you need, you, people need to realize that's important because right now, as, as, as much as I, I hate to admit it, it's still like the most people, the, the seats are occupied uh, by men. So, um, so build that, build up that uh, uh, advocate and find the people that has daughters and want and, you know, willing to participate and support you. Well, they're out there. So I think there need to be more, uh, more effort to build up that way. And then I just want to mention one other thing that I like what uh, Kani said. Build your network, build your network, build your network. As after the first entry level job, after that, it's all about network. I heard one le women leader one time told me that, um, you know, as you go to a certain level, 70%, 70, 70% 70 of your effort should be networking because that's where you get the next job. Around. And then when you do networking, that that's the mean that just make people know you, offer help. Network means you offer what you got, show me, sh do things for others. And then once you do that, and if you do it for the right people, they will remember you and good things will come back and your name will be, will, will be, will pop up. So that's why networking is so important, build up the network. So you need to continue to work that consciously with, um, with thoughtfulness and mindfulness and build that network. And then you, it will, it takes time, takes effort, and then uh, it's not in our, a lot of Asians, uh, you know, in our natural, it's not natural for us a lot of time, but you have to do that. And then if you shy, do one-on-one. -on -one. We're all very good at one-on-one. -on -one. one to two, that kind of environment. Have pre-meetings. If you're not, if you're afraid of having, a, the, the best meeting is you already know what everybody's going to say, what every position is. So have those one-on-one -on -one meetings and, and, and the uh, um, map, find out what you're good at and milk it. You don't need to say, I need to improve my weaknesses. No, you find your strength, what you're really good at. You'll make sure you're really, really good at that. And then just milk it and then make it big, make you know. So I think that's, so, so I think those are the good things for you to build up your career. Thank you. And Sarah, I'll let you have the last uh, note here for this question. I think managers and leaders need to understand how people different and diverse backgrounds, maybe a factor in what they bring to the table, how they show up to work, what they might have gone through before they got to work, or you know, whether that's that morning, last week, or you know, 20 years preceding them coming into, into work that day. Um, you need to look, understand what people really want, because um, it's not always going to be the same. Look for stretch opportunities or opportunities outside their normal function to help them grow their network and showcase their ability. You know, I agree 100% with what Diane said about networking. It's incredibly important. I got my last two roles through my network, people either reaching out to me directly and saying, I want you for this role. Um, you are my preferred candidate or someone giving me a really good reference to, uh, to the hiring manager. So my network has been huge in me being able to uh, get my next job and also succeed in my job because there's a problem. There's, you know, I have a lot of people I can reach out to and usually if some, I can find someone who can solve it or I, they know someone who can solve it to help me with it. Um, I think people need to be very honest and specific on the future goals. Um, if you don't want to do something or you really want to do something, to be very clear on that so you don't end up going you know, down a road that doesn't really make sense for you. Um, and to find what I call it the with him, the what's in it for me, it helps with that. In those one-on-one -on -one conversations that Diane was talking about, those are great places to find those. And then it helps you tailor your conversations to get, help get that buy-in from others um, in trying to make those tough decisions. Thank you. And I'll let uh, uh, Wandala and Kalyani with any uh, final closing remarks. Uh, for our panel today. Uh, Wandala, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can say something. This is such an important thing because, yes, people are working very hard, but people around them, especially leaders, should also be supporting them all the time. Uh, 
the most important thing is leaders should be aware of what people are doing and how they can support them further especially when it comes to pay that they should be aware that some people are not paid equally to the others so leaders should be making a conscious effort and uh, talking to hr about it that here is the person who has done so and so and should be rewarded accordingly and i have seen happening uh, these days so this is uh, on the leaders how do you make a conscious effort and on employees yes you have to find those networks but also be talking to your bosses about that i have done this and constantly promoting yourself as well sometimes if uh, people like us don't talk then they will never know and when times comes for um, promotion or pay raises how will the leaders know about it so it goes both ways obviously everyone has to be aware of what is happening so very very important to develop next leaders and next gen of leaders thank you kalyani what about you i think the only thing i would add is we all have a power to our voice and we can all be advocates you don't have to be in a senior leadership position to be an advocate you can be an advocate to a peer you can be an advocate to a leader that you work for and you know you can advocate for somebody who works for you right so my ask is there is power to your voice so be that advocate and be that inclusive person for somebody else because to Diane's point it'll all come back and some day somebody else will do that for you and uh, i believe in karma right so it all comes back and do good so all right thank you and thank you to all of you uh for sharing with us your experiences perspectives and amazing advice i want to thank all of you for joining us in our presentation today i hope you found it interesting and useful in taking those next steps whatever you want in your career as well as for advocating for others I'd love to invite you to connect with the SWE Asian Connections Affinity Group via our link tree and don't forget to complete the session survey with the QR code that's on the screen. So once again, thank you. We appreciate you taking the time and initiative to attend this WE21 presentation virtually. I hope you will have the opportunity to join us in person next October at WE22 in Houston, Texas. Until then, be smart, stay healthy, and aspire to inspire.